Hi, Year 6, and welcome to a new day's reading home learning. And today we're just going to continue reading the book. So we're going to go through this chapter and on to the next chapter, and we're just going to continue reading. Under the rocky wall to the right there was no path, so on they trudged among the stones on the left side of the river, and the emptiness and desolation soon sobered even Thorin again. The bridge that Barlin had spoken of they found long fallen, and most of its stones were now only boulders in the shallow, noisy stream. But they forded the water without much difficulty, and found the ancient steps, and climbed the high bank. After going a short way, they struck the old road, and before long came to a deep dell sheltered among the rocks. There they rested for a while, and had such a breakfast as they could, chiefly cram and water. If you want to know what cram is, I can only say that I don't know the recipe but it is biscuitish, keeps good indefinitely, is supposed to be sustaining and is certainly not entertaining, being in fact very uninteresting except as a chewing exercise. It was made by the lake men for long journeys. After that they went on again, and now the road struck westwards and left the river, and the great shoulder of the south pointing mountain spur drew ever nearer. At length they reached the hill path, it scrambled steeply up and they plodded slowly one behind the other, so that last in the late afternoon they came to the top of the ridge and saw the wintry sun going downwards to the west. Here they found a flat place without a wall on three sides, but backed to the north by a rocky face in which they were, there was an opening like a door. From that door there was a wide view east and south and west. Here, said Barlin, in the old days we used to keep watchmen, and that door behind leads into the rock-hewn chamber that was made here as a guard room. There are several places like it round the mountain, but there seems small need for watching at the, in the days of prosperity, and the guards were made over-comfortable. Perhaps, otherwise we might have had longer wa warning of the coming of the dragon, and things might have been different. Still, here we can now lie hid and sheltered for a while, and can see much without being seen. Not much use if we have not if we have been seen coming. Here, said Dory, who was all looking up towards the mountain's peak, as if he expected to see Small perched there like a bird on a steeple. We must take our chance of that, said Thorin. We can go no further today. Hear, hear, cried Bilbo, and flung himself on the ground. In the rock chamber there had been room for a hundred, and there was a small chamber further in, more removed from the cold outside. It was quite deserted. Not even wild animals seemed to have used it in the days of Smog's dominion. There they laid their burdens, and some threw themselves down at once and slept, but the others sat near the outer door and discussed their plans. In all their talk they came perpetually back to one thing. Where was Smog? They looked west and there was nothing, and east there was nothing, and in the south there was no sign of the dragon, but there was a gathering of many birds, and that they gazed and wondered, but they were no nearer understanding it when the first cold stars came out. Okay, chapter 14, fire and water, and I think things are about to get very exciting. Now, if you wish, like the dwarves, to hear news of Smog, you must go back again to the evening when he smashed the door and flew off in range, two days before. The men of the lake town Esgaroth were mostly indoors, for the breeze was from the black east, and chill, but a few were walking on the quays and watching, as they were fond of doing. The stars shine out from the smooth patches of the lake as they opened in the sky. From their town the lonely mountain was mostly screened by the low hills at the far end of the lake, though a gap in which the running river came down from the north. Only its high peak could they see in clear weather, and they looked seldom at it, for it was ominous and drear even in the light of morning. Now it was lost and gone, bottled in the dark. Suddenly it flickered back into view. A brief glow touched it and faded. Look, said one, the light again. Last night the watchman saw them start and fade from midnight until dawn. Something is happening up there. Perhaps the king under the mountain is forging gold, said another. It is long since he went north. It is time the songs began to prove themselves again. Which king, said another grim voice. As like, it, as like as not, it is the marauding fire of the dragon, the only king under the mountain we have ever known. You are always foreboding gloomy things, said the others. 
Anything from floods to poison fish. Think of something cheerful. Then suddenly a great light appeared in the low place in the hills, and the northern end of the lake turned gold. The king beneath the mountain, they shouted. His wealth is like the sun, his silver like a fountain, his rivers golden run. The river is running gold from the mountain, they cried. And everywhere windows were opening and feet were hurrying. There was once more a tremendous excitement and enthusiasm. But the grim-voiced fellow ran hotfoot to the master. The dragon is coming or I'm a fool, he cried. Cut the bridges, to arms, to arms. Then warning trumpets were suddenly sounded and echoed along the rocky shores. The cheering stopped and the joy was turned to dread. So it was that the dragon did not find them quite unprepared. Before long, so great was his speed, they could see him as a spark of fire rushing towards them and growing ever huger and more bright, and not the most foolish doubted that the prophecies had gone rather wrong. Still they had a little time. Every vessel in the town was filled with water, every warrior was armed, every arrow and darts was ready, and the bridge to the land was thrown down and destroyed, before the roar of Smog's terrible approach grew loud and the lake rippled red as fire beneath the awful beating of his wings. Amid shrieks and wailing and the shouts of men he came over them, swept towards the bridges and was foiled. The bridge was gone and his enemies were on an island in deep water, too deep and dark and cool for his liking. If he plunged into it, a vapour on a stream would arise enough to cover all the land with a mist for days. But the lake was mightier than he, it would quench him before he could pass through. Roaring, he swept back over the town. A hail of dark arrows leaped up and snapped and rattled on his scales and jewels, and their shafts fell back, kindled by his breath, burning and hissing into the lake. No fireworks you ever imagined equalled the sights that night. At the twanging of the bows and the shrilling of the trumpets, the dragon's wrath blazed to its height till he was blind and mad with it. No one had dared to give battle to him for many an age, nor would they have dared now if it had not been for the grim-voiced man, Bard was his name, who ran to and fro, cheering on the archers and urging the bastard to order them to fight to the last arrow. Fire leapt from the dragon's jaws. He circled for a while, high in the air above them, lighting all the lake. The trees by the shore shone like copper and like gold with leaping shadows, of dense black at their feet. Then down he swooped straight through the arrow storm, reckless in his rage, taking no heed to turn his scaly sides towards his foes, seeking only to set their town ablaze. Fire leaped from thatched roofs and wooden beam ends as he hurtled down and passed and round again, though all had been drenched with water before he came. Once more water was flung by a hundred hands wherever a spark appeared. Back swelled the dragon, a sweep of his tail and the roof of the great house crumbled and smashed down. Flames unquenchable sprang high into the night. Another swoop and another, and another house and then another sprang afire and fell, and still no arrow hindered Smog or hurt him more than a fly from the marshes. Already men were jumping into the water on every side. Women and children were being huddled into laden boats in the market pool. Weapons were flung down. There was mourning and weeping, where but a little time ago the old songs of mirth to come had been sung about the dwarves. Now men cursed their names. The master himself was turning to his great gilded boat, hoping to row away in the confusion and save himself. Soon all the town would be deserted and burned down to the surface of the lake. That was the dragon's hope. They could all get into boats for all he cared. There he could have fine sport hunting them, or they could stop till they starved. Let them try and get to land, and he would be ready. Soon he would set all the shoreland woods ablaze and wither every field and pasture. Just now he was enjoying the sport of town baiting more than he enjoyed anything for years. But there was still a company of archers that held their ground among the burning houses. Their captain was barred, grim-voiced and grim-faced, whose friends had accused him of prophesying floods and poison fish, though they knew his worth and courage. He was descendant in long line of Girion, Lord of Dale, whose wife and child had escaped down the running river from the ruin long ago. 
Now he shot with a great yew bow, till all his arrows but one were spent. The flames were near him, his companions were leaving him. He bent his bow for the last time. Suddenly out of the dark, something fluttered to his shoulder. He started, but it was only an old thrush. Unafraid, it perched by his ear and it brought him news. Marvelling, he found he could understand its tongue, for he was the race of Dale. Wait, wait, it said to him. The moon is rising. Look for the hollow of the left breast as he flies and turns above you. And while Barb paused in wonder, it told him of the tidings up in the mountain of all that it had heard. Then Bard drew his bowstring back to his ear. The dragon, the dragon was circling back, flying low, and as he came, the moon rose above the eastern shore and silvered his great wings. Arrow, said the bowman. Black arrow, I have saved you to last. You have never failed me, and always I have recovered you. If you... If had I had you from my father, and he from old, if ever you come from the forges of the true king under the mountain, go now and speed well. The dragon swooped once more, lower than ever, and as he turned and dived down, his belly glittered white with sparkling fires of gems in the moon, but not in one place. The great bow twanged. The black arrow sped straight from the string, straight by the hollow by the left breast, where the foreleg was swung, flung wide. In it smote and vanished, barb, shaft and feather, so fierce was its flight. With a shriek that deafened men, felled trees and split stone, smog shot spouting into the air, turning over and crashing down from on high in ruin. Full on the town he fell, his last throes splintered into sparks and glades. The lake roared in, a vast stream steam leapt up, white in the sudden dark under the moon. There was a hiss, a gushing whirl, and then silence. And that was the end of Smorg and Esgaroth, but not of Bard. And here we can see actually the dragon. He's been shot and he's fallen into the lake. The waxing moon rose higher and higher, and the wind grew loud and cold. It twisted the white fog into bending pillars and hurrying clouds and drove it off to the west to scatter in tattered shreds over the marshes before Mirkwood. Then the many boats could be seen dotted dark on the surface of the lake, and down the wind came the voices of the people of Esgaroth, lamenting their lost town and goods and ruined houses. But they had really much to be thankful for had they not thought about it, though it could hardly be expected that they should just then, three quarters of the people of the town had at least escaped alive. Their woods and fields and pasture and cattle and most of their boats remained undamaged. And the dragon was dead. What that meant they had not yet realised. They gathered in mournful crowds upon the western shores, shivering in the cold wind, and their first complaints and anger were against the master who had left the town so soon, while some were still willing to defend it. He may have a good head for business, especially his own business, some murmured, but he's no good when anything serious happens. And they praised the courage of Bard and his last mighty shot. If only he had not been killed, they all said, we would make him a king. Bard the dragon shooter of the line of Girion. Alas that he is lost. And in the very midst of their talk, a tall figure stepped from the shadows. He was drenched with water. His black hair hung wet over his face and shoulders and a fierce light was in his eyes. Bard's not lost, he cried. He died from Esgroth when the enemy was slain. I am Bard of the line of Girion. I am the slayer of the dragon. King Bard! King Bard! they shouted, but the master ground his chattering teeth. Girion was Lord of Dale, not King of Esgroth, he said. In the Lake Town we have always elected masters from among the old and wise, and have not endured the rule of mere fighting men. Let King Bard go back to his own kingdom. Dale is now freed by his valour, and nothing hinders his return. And any that wish can go with him, if they prefer the cold stones under the shadow of the mountain to the green shores of the lake. The wise will stay here and hope to rebuild our town and enjoy again in time its peace and riches. We will have King Bard, the people near at hand shouted in reply. 
We have had enough of old men and the money counters. And people further off to cut the cry. Up the bowmen and down the money bags. Till the clamour echoed among the shore. I am the last man to undervalue Bard the bowman, said the master warily, warily, for Bard now stood close beside him. He has tonight earned an eminent place in the role of the benefactors of our town, and he is worthy of many imperishable songs. But why, O oh people? And here the master rose to his feet and spoke very loud and clear. Why do I get all the blame? For, for, for what fault am I to be deposed? Who aroused the dragon from his slumber, I might ask? Who obtained of us rich gifts and ample help and led us to believe that old songs could come true? Who played on our soft hearts and our pleasant fancies? What sort of gold have they sent down the river to reward us? Dragon fire and ruin. From whom should we claim the recompense of our damage and aid for our widows and orphans? As you can see, the master had not got his position for nothing. The result of his words was that for the moment the people quite forgot their idea of a new king and turned their angry thoughts towards Thorin and his company. Wild and bitter words were shouted from many sides and some of those who had before sung the old songs loudest were now heard as loudly crying that the dwarves had stirred the dragon up against them deliberately. Fools, said Bard, why waste words and wrath on those unhappy creatures? Doubtless they perished first in the fire before small came to it. Then even as he was speaking, the thought came into his heart of the fabled treasure of the mountain, lying without guard or owner, and he fell suddenly silent. He thought of the master's words and of Dale rebuilt and filled with golden bells, if they could find the men. At length he spoke again. This is no time for angry words, master, or for considering weighty plans of change. There is work to do. I serve you still. Though after a while I may think again of your words to go north with any that will follow me. Then he strode off to help in the ordering of the camp and in the care of the sick and wounded. But the master scowled at him his back as he went and remained sitting on the ground. He thought much but said little, unless it was to call loudly for men to bring him fire and food. We're going to stop there for today. So we're going to stop there after food. So well done for reading with me today because we're reading quite a lot at the moment because we're going to try and finish the book over the next couple of days.